Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today, I just wanted to talk about one of the questions that I get the most often being an astrophotographer, and that is, what telescopes do I use? And the answer is, I have a lot. I've got a lot of telescopes. And in this video, I just wanted to go through every single telescope I own, talk about why I got it, what I use it for, how much was it, and yeah, just every, every scope I've got, what I use it for, how much it costs me, and, uh, I'll show you some photos with each one that I took. So for this video, I'm going to start out small and we're going to work our way up into the bigger telescopes that I own. So without further ado, let us get our first telescope here and set down this cat. This, his name is Annie and he's going to try and sit on my lap for the whole course of the video. The smallest telescope that I own and the first one that we're going to talk about in my telescope collection is the Radian Raptor 61. So this one is actually on loan to me from OPT. Luckily, I, <laughs> I haven't had to pay for this telescope, but for all of my other telescopes, I do have to spend my own money for them, which is really fun, as many of you know. Anyways, this Radian 61, uh, it is a good wide field imaging scope. So it's got a focal length somewhere, I think around 300 millimeters. It's very small, very compact, and it's just designed for wider DSO imaging of larger objects or doing mosaics. It is quoted to supporting up to a full frame sensor. It does support a full frame sensor. The corners do kind of get hairy and it does have a bit of chromatic aberration. But what I like to use this telescope for is just if I'm road tripping or I'm traveling and I don't want to bring a whole giant telescope, then this is a very nice, small, compact telescope that I can take with me, and it gets the job done. Uh, the last image I shot with this was Orion and the Horsehead Nebula at once. I shot it with a uh, Canon 6D Mark II from Eastern Utah, so I'll put that image up now, but uh, it did the job. Um, the chromatic aberration processed out pretty much entirely, um, and it produced a pretty great looking image. So this is the first telescope in the collection, Radian 61. All right, the cat has stolen the chair from me while I went and grabbed the second telescope. Now this second telescope is one that's a bit more special to me. It is the second largest telescope in my collection and it is my very first real, real imaging telescope. This isn't actually my first telescope. My first telescope was a Orion Star Blast Newtonian, but this is the first one that I ever truly hooked up a DSLR to and did real astrophotography with. So this is the ED80T-CF model. It's an 80 millimeter APO and it's got 480 millimeters of focal length and it's at f6. So pretty slow, fair amount of reach, but it's nice and small and I like the carbon fiber. One of the first things I did to this telescope from the stock model is I took off the stock focuser because the stock focuser on this telescope is pretty bad, especially if you're hanging a heavy camera off the back. And I was using a ST8300M with OAG and a filter wheel off the back of this with the stock focuser when I first started getting into CCD imaging and this focuser was not enough. So I put a Moonlight 2 inch on the back and this has done just a great job. I love Moonlight stuff and I've continued to use it on some of my other telescopes as well. But I've shot so many images through this telescope and it is good for if you're going up to a crop sensor, I will say that. For astrophotography, for a beginner telescope, it's really hard to go wrong with this. Uh, it's also really hard to go wrong with the Radian 61. I mean, they both have their trade-offs. It's just one is more zoomed in than the other. These are both really good starter telescopes, and it worked out for me as a starter telescope, as you can tell. But for a smaller sensor camera, this is perfect. If you're wanting to shoot full frame, this is not perfect. It has like the worst lens flaring known to man, the worst internal reflections if you start using a bigger sensor. So keep your sensor size down, don't go above crop, and this will be a, a perfect little telescope for you. The corners on it are pretty okay, and there really isn't any chromatic aberration on it. And yeah, it's just performed very well for me as a, as a starter APO. So I'll give you up close of this.
Alrighty, so the next largest telescope in my collection is actually the one I've been using as a backdrop for this video and probably my last video as well. This is the BabyQ FSQ85 Takahashi, and this is a smaller refractor. It's actually quite similar to the Orion EDA, ED80TCF that I just showed last. It has 85 millimeters of aperture, 450 millimeters of focal length, and I think this puts it at like f5 instead of f6 for the orion so this is a bit faster uh, a bit less reach but it supports a full frame chip a lot more nicely than the cheaper refractor so that's why i've got a i've got a full frame 6200 mm on the back and this is going to be used as a remote observatory telescope i'm currently finishing building this out there's a couple finishing touches i need but what this is going to be doing is southern hemisphere imaging from namibia and this is just going to be a general purpose small refractor that i'm going to use to kind of get my feet wet to the region try and see you know how i like it how i like the southern hemisphere but this is what we're sending down and it's hopefully going to be a really nice astrograph i've only shot one image through this scope I'm waiting for the rest of the parts to get in for the train. I'm replacing the, the stock focuser on this, but I shot one other image from Death Valley using a, a reducer, a QB.73 reducer on the scope with a full frame camera. And it ended up okay. Um, there are some qualms that I have about the Takahashis. One being if you use them with focal reducers, you have to be very careful. Uh, they don't work very well on every telescope for full frame and Apart from that, the stock focusers on the Takahashis are really, really bad. I've used a number of them, and if you try and put an autofocuser on this stock focuser on this telescope, it's not going to be a very fun time. And I don't know if I can demonstrate it, but the reason is, as you rack through the finest point of focus, it actually, the, the whole focuser assembly like shifts up onto the rack and pinion or whatever assembly, and the whole image shifts. And this basically means you can't really do a good autofocus run if you're planning on just smacking a, you know, an autofocuser on the side of this and calling it a day. It just doesn't really work that well. And I've tried it and it doesn't, it doesn't work. It's not a good time. So I'm taking the focuser off of this. And once I get a, a full focuser on it, I got a Asado three inch, then it's hopefully fingers crossed, completely ready to be shipped out and used in a Namibia. So that's what this telescope is for. Uh, this one, oh, I forgot. I forgot to mention how much I paid for my Orion telescope. The last telescope I showed, I paid like $1,000 for. This telescope actually does not belong to me. This belongs to a uh, star punker, and we are working together to set up the observatory in Namibia. In exchange for <laughs> sharing the data, he also provided the camera on the back. So this camera and this scope were contributions of him and we're gonna share the images from the system when it's in the Southern Hemisphere. So that saves me a lot of money. Uh, this filter wheel and the filters, I had to pick up, which I did Antlia's. I hope they're pretty good, but we'll see. This is also an important moment. You might notice there's a thing on top of my telescope. And technically speaking, this isn't a telescope. This is a camera lens, but it's worth talking about as if it was a telescope because I'm pretty much using it like one. So this is a Rockinon. 135 millimeter f2 lens and i've got a 3d printed lens bracket and i've also got a zwo eaf with a focusing belt on it and what that's going to let me do is shoot ultra wide field camera lens images with an autofocuser and i've got a 6200 mc on the back and this is also this is all riding together to namibia as a complete package so i will be able to do some wide field milky way while the scope is down there and that was one of my main hopes. I wanted a system that could do a whole sky image from the Southern Hemisphere so that I could at least get, you know, that whole part of the sky imaged and hopefully one day make an all sky survey. So that's the hope. Uh, this is going to be hopefully, you know, getting the dream done. And yeah, the, the Rockin' on 135 cost me like $550 and it's just an absolute beast of a camera lens it does really great and i have shot a couple mosaics with this before as testers uh, i shot them all from utah and it, it's just a really great 
really great camera lens system. So all of this together, the whole goal is to just sample everything in the Southern Hemisphere and hopefully get some cool images. So yeah, this is the FSQ85 and Rockin' on 135. If you were to purchase an FSQ85 new, it would go like 3,500, I believe. And the field flattener, which I have on it, would also cost you like $300. So about $3,800 for that rig, at least the, the Takahashi OTA, which is kind of a lot. It's a big step up from the, the Orion refractor, but it's not meant to be an introductory telescope like the Orion one is. Both get the job done. Just one does it full frame and one doesn't do it full frame. That's literally all you're paying for. You still have to replace the focuser and you still need a field flattener. So that is it. Now let's, Let's get to the next telescope. All right, this next telescope is a bit of a jump up in size. This is <laughs> an Explore Scientific AR-127 uh, doublet refractor. And if you wanna know what I use it for, that's what I use it for. This is a solar only telescope. This telescope, the, the AR-127 for me, I paid 600 used for this scope a while ago and I only got it to do solar photography. So that's literally the only thing I'd use it for. It is, let's see here, F, F something. It has 825 millimeters of focal length and a frontal diameter of 127 millimeters. So coupled with a Daystar cork, this gives it a whole lot of reach for imaging the sun. And yeah, that's, that's the whole thing I use this for. You may notice at the top here, I have a, what's called a Hinod solar guider. And I use this to auto guide on the sun. But yeah, this telescope is, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, like I said, it only has like a one track purpose for me. If you were to use a doublet for anything else, you're gonna suffer chromatic aberration pretty bad. I don't use it for anything else though, so it's kind of the perfect tool for me to end up doing solar. And if you look at people doing a lot of hydrogen alpha solar imaging, a lot of people use the Explore Scientific Refractors because they're big, they're cheap, and they give you a lot of reach. The whole general combo is you pick an Explore Scientific Refractor, you throw a cork on it, and then you put an ASI-174 or any other camera that has the same chip on it. And then that's, that's just the general solar setup for most people. And it does the job. I will say my cork is pretty bad. It's not great. Uh, I'm not very happy with the contrast on it, but uh, it's the one I've got. So yeah, this is a bit less interesting, but this is, this is the solar telescope. It's a big refractor. It only has two lenses instead of three, but it doesn't matter to me because I'm only looking at such a narrow bit of light in HA that I don't see any chromatic aberration at all when I do my solar because I'm not looking at any colors, but just one. So uh, some things I don't like about this telescope are the, again, the stock focuser is pretty bad. That tends to be the case on any kind of cheaper refractor. And, you know, honestly, even the expensive ones, I can't really name a good, <laughs> a good refractor that actually comes with a good stock autofocuser. Um, the Radians, the Radian 61, its focuser is actually really, really nice. Uh, that is the only camera I can think of that's rocking like a good stock focuser. So hats off to Radian. Uh, the rest, really bad. Takahashi's bad, Orion bad. Explore Scientific, meh, eh, they're all leaving a lot to be desired in the autofocus department, but it gets the job done. The next telescope in the list is actually not with me as we speak. It is remote in Sierra Remote Observatory, which is 900 miles away from me. So I'll show you some B-roll to show you the telescope. Uh, this telescope is kind of my main imaging telescope for any kind of wide field or mosaic need. And that's what I'm trying to specialize in is uh, doing really nice deep mosaics. And this is my workhorse telescope for doing that. It came at quite a pretty penny though. And it came at a time, I purchased it at a time when the supply chain for Takahashi's was totally crumbling. I emailed Takahashi and they were telling me May 2023 is the next time you're going to be able to get a telescope. And I was really looking to make a large purchase to have something that totally changed up my astrophotography and 
gave me a lot of extra capability, which is what I was hoping for. So I ended up acquiring this telescope used from someone on Astro Mart. I paid, I think, six grand for it. And <laughs> it is a lot, but keep in mind, uh, you don't need to spend this much to do astrophotography. This is just when you're looking for the top of the line, no expenses spared to take the best images, what are you gonna get? And that's what I decided on going with. And it's been a great telescope for me so far. Um, it is natively, I think, F5 and 530 millimeters of focal length but that's not actually how I use the telescope. I use it reduced with a, I use it reduced with a 0.73 focal reducer, which brings me down to F3.6 and 389 millimeters of focal length. And for imaging, that's the whole reason why I got this telescope is because I can image super fast, super wide, full frame, and just plow through mosaics and get super deep details. That was the whole hope and it's worked out pretty well. It did have a stock Takahashi focuser on it and I did get rid of it pretty much immediately. So before I, uh, I got the telescope, I had totally in mind everything that I was going to get for it. So for the focuser, I replaced it with the Moonlight Nightcrawler, which cost me like $3,800. And this lets me do autofocusing and rotation remotely. And it's been an absolute beast of a focuser. It's so heavy. It honestly, it weighs more probably than the Radian 61 or my 80 millimeter refractor, it's absolute tank. And it holds my camera very well. I'm using a QHY 600 on the back of that system. And it's just been really great. It's produced all of my uh, recent images that are wide field that you've seen here or on Instagram. And what is what else is there to say about it? I mean, it's just a great telescope. It cost me so much though, it was, over 10k just for the telescope which is really 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 ridiculous and for the cost that it is it's not even that great in the corners for a full frame sensor my corners are a little dicey even reduced with precise parts and the correct backspacing anything the corners and the star shapes still like aren't perfect which is what you would you know hope for with an instrument that expensive but i'm choosing not to pixel peep too hard i mean Sometimes it looks good, sometimes it's a bit off, but for the images I'm doing where it's mosaics, it's really hard to notice any corner issues in the stars. So I kind of live with it, but I'm really excited to see people coming out with telescopes that uh, you know can actually support full frame because there aren't very many. There's a lot of telescopes that quote full frame, but then when you look at the corners, they're actually pretty garbage. And it's kind of the case if you're, if you're using an un, if you're using a reduced Takahashi, chances are it's going to be messed up with a modern day camera. If you're using like an old CCD with nine micron pixels, sure, it's totally fine. But with today's cameras, it's not good enough. And that's actually why I replaced the QE 0.73 reducer off of this with just the field flattener, because unreduced, the Takahashis are pretty good. So that's something to think about if you're willing to live with bad corners in a Takahashi. You can go reduced, but otherwise you should stick to probably an unreduced Takahashi if you want perfect corners. Just something to think about. Uh, let's get to the next biggest telescope. And this one's going to be a bit different because it's not a refractor. <laughs> you may notice that pretty much every telescope I own is a refractor and they're just good for taking photos is generally the case. Uh, I've owned other telescopes or I've used many other telescopes that aren't refractors. Like I've used a RH200 Veloce. I've used, well, I haven't really imaged through a newt before, but when you use mirrors and stuff like that, things become a bit more difficult for deep sky. So for deep sky in general, you'll typically find me using a refractor first. Okay, so the next telescope in my telescope collection is kind of shaking things up. Instead of a refractor, we've got a C925 Edge HD, and we're currently configured for planetary at the moment. So the C925 Edge HD is uh, F10 something, I don't know. I don't, I don't like to think about specs that much. Specs don't really matter. No, that, <laughs> sorry, specs do matter, but they don't really cross my thought too much. So I kind of forget them, but this is like F10. The focal length is 2350 millimeters. And what I use this for is, it's kind of a multi-purpose telescope for me, but I do lunar and planetary and that's pretty much it. But I use it in kind of distinctly different ways. So if I'm doing high res lunar, or if I'm doing planetary with the scope, I'm using it as you see here, where I have a Barlow and a planetary camera, or I'll just run straight to a planetary camera without a Barlow. And for that, I'll be shooting high frame rate video and doing a lot of stacking 
and trying to pull as much resolution out from the scope as possible. At 2350 millimeters, it's not the best for planetary. It has an okay amount of reach, but it's a bit lacking for detail, especially compared to C11 images. But I mean, it's all dependent on your seeing anyways, and it kind of gets the job done as much as I need for the moment. And it's about at the, <laughs> the maximum size that, of telescope that I'd want to deal with personally. But other than that, I also use this to do just lunar imaging, uh, primarily if I'm going out to shoot an eclipse or if I'm just looking to do a quick full moon image, this is the scope that I reach for when I go to do that. I would not get a larger telescope for DSLR moon images because this basically fills the whole, a, a full frame sensor with the moon. And if it's a super moon or something like that, it won't fit the full moon in a full frame sensor. <laughs> it's basically like right on the borderline between between being too zoomed in to shoot just a quick moon shot. So if you're just looking to do moon pictures of the DSLR, the C8 Edge HD might actually be a bit better for you because you can actually fit it in. The other problem is, well, the corners on a full frame on the sensor are not so good, and it leads to some problems with some of my moon photos. So when I shoot it with the DSLR, when I'm doing it with a planetary camera and a small sensor, it's a non-factor, but if you're putting a big sensor on a telescope like this, a schmidt cassegrain it might struggle. Uh, this is a common thing is telescopes quoting full frame and then it turns out it's actually pretty bad full frame. And that's the case with this Edge HD for me. And this might just be my copy, I'm not sure, but I purchased this used from a man in Utah uh, December, around December of 2021. And I purchased this telescope exclusively to shoot the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn because it had the right amount of zoom to fit both in at once and it was just the ideal telescope to do that without being too zoomed in and it did the job pretty well for that. Uh, I purchased it, I think it was two grand I paid for. It came with an autofocuser on the back but I just ripped it off because I'm barely ever autofocusing. I'm not using this for deep sky. And not to mention the Celestron autofocuser on the back of this telescope just is so sloppy it doesn't really work. You, If you are, are gonna put a telescope autofocuser on this, you need to replace the focuser with the Crayford on the back. Like the stock focuser is just really bad. You're gonna suffer from mirror flop. The whole image shifts around when you tune the knob on the back. So autofocusing or manual focusing stock leaves a ton to be desired with this telescope as well. But it does the job relatively well. Um, I would like to maybe get rid of this at some point and go to a slightly larger SDT or maybe a slightly smaller one. It just depends on, you know, how much planetary imaging I plan to be doing in the future versus how much lunar imaging because this struggles a bit with the full frame and it also doesn't provide as much reach as I would want on planets. So it's kind of like a middle ground where it's okay, but it's not great, but we still use it because I can't really justify spending three grand on a large one. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the C925, my dirty, dirty telescope. Maybe get the thumbnail shot too, huh? But yeah, there we go. Got the thumbnail. Easy. All right, now the final, final telescope in my collection and also the largest one also does not live here. It's at Sierra Remote Observatories and it's also one that I don't own personally, but the reason that I'm including it in this list of telescope collections is it's because it's one that I use so frequently. I use it, I've used it every night for almost the last two years. I've become very familiar with it and it's become, you know, one of the telescopes that produces most of my images uh, because it's just so great. And I've become so familiar and intimate with it. I'm throwing it on this list, but I must preface that I don't have enough money to own a telescope nearly this expensive. It's one that uh, I've had access to through Sierra Remote Observatory for running the system because uh, Keith, the owner who owns the observatory and owns the telescope, is a bit too busy with, you know, real life things like brain surgery because he's a brain surgeon and running the observatory. So I make sure that this instrument is never going to waste. Every clear night, it's always doing something. So I'm throwing it on this list just because a lot of the images that I produce come from it, so you should at least know that this is what I'm using. So the telescope itself is a 16-inch ARCOS, which stands for Ritchie Kreischen Optical Systems, and it is sitting on a Paramount ME, and it has a, a full-frame camera on the back. Now this telescope is f9, and it has a focal length that is 3,658 millimeters, 
which is literally absurd. It's almost double that of the C925. So if you think about reach, it has absolutely ridiculous reach and it's razor tack sharp. It's an insane telescope. And the unfortunate thing about them is that you can't actually purchase them for any more, or you can't actually purchase them anymore because the company that produces them went out of business. And I think the reason why is it's something related to government contracts. Like they, they got a contract that they just couldn't fulfill. So they filed for bankruptcy and now you can't get them anymore. So it's a bit of a relic and a rare optic, but it's a very great one. There's a number of people still using them to produce really great images, like the 32-inch Schulman telescope Adam Blocks on Mount Lemmon is an Arcos. So a lot of Arcos telescopes are still hanging around and still seeing a lot of use, and this is one of them. And it's just, it's a really incredible telescope. I think if you were to purchase them new, they're like 40 grand for the 16-inch. I believe that's how much they were. Uh, so they're very expensive, large telescopes intended for institutions or the most extreme astrophotographers. The only equivalent today that you could see in a telescope would be if you were to purchase a plane wave, a large Officina Stellare or an ASA, you know, these highly premium large CDK telescope manufacturers are only the only equivalent ones that you could probably get today. The interesting thing that I find different about the Arcos versus the modern, more modern component telescopes, the more modern telescopes are faster for their size, but they have way less focal length for their size. So the plane waves you'll find generally are maybe F6 to F7. So if you look at a 17 inch plane wave, it doesn't have nearly as much reach as the 16 inch Arcos does in terms of focal length. So if you're trying to go very high resolution, it's a lot more optimized for that than the plane waves are. So that gives a lot of unique possibilities for going for way smaller targets. You do suffer, of course, being at F9. Here's the cat. You do suffer a bit being at F9 with the Arcos, but uh, if you're willing to do some longer exposures and you have some good seeing, then it ends up being a win-win and giving you a bit of extra reach and a bit of extra possibilities to see things in higher resolution compared to the plane waves. The bad parts about the Arcos are that it has a lot of old electronics components it's old control system you can't really buy anymore because the company has been bankrupt and it's just gone. So because the software is unsupported, the electronics will slowly start to break. You have to replace the parts on it with more modern components. So we have a Gemini autofocuser and rotator on the back instead of the Arcos model. And it's the only downside is just that they're not supported and you have to replace breaking parts with more modern ones. And once you do that, then it's a great scope and it, it functions perfectly, but they, in this day and age, they do need a little bit of work to get, you know, perfectly operating. So those were all of my telescopes uh, or all of the telescopes that I use frequently. So we started with the Radian 61. You can get those for this much. And then we had the ED80 TCF, which costs about 1100. Then we worked our way up to the ESAR-127, which I got for about 600 used. And then we take a step up to the FSQ-106, which cost me 6 to 10K if you factor in the autofocuser. Then going up to the C925, it costs like 2K used. And then all the way at the top end is the Arcos, which does not have a price tag because it's priceless. It's a priceless instrument. But... <laughs> You will notice uh, I buy a lot of my telescopes used. I don't frequently buy a new telescope. In fact, I haven't purchased a new telescope in probably seven years. And the reason I don't really buy new telescopes is because I like to save as much money as possible and I know exactly what I want. So I will wait for a good used deal and I will pounce upon it once I have the thing in mind. That's why all my telescopes are used. I'm trying to save as much money as possible, and I do that via Cloudy Nights, Astro Mart, or you can find some used stuff on OPT's website. But if you know what you want, then it can be highly worth it for you to just save your money and wait for a used deal to pop up, and that way you can save as much money as possible. And that's what I do, because all the stuff is way too expensive, and I'm trying to save as much money to get the best photos at the same time. Yeah, if uh, if you're 
watching this video and thinking about, you know, what telescope do I get to start out? The general advice, if you're doing astrophotography, is a small 80 millimeter refractor similar to the one that I started out with. And you are going to need a mount, you are going to need a camera, and probably an auto guider, but that's generally the way to go. The 80 millimeter refractor or something like the Radian 61 will treat you very nicely and it'll get the job done. Now, looking at all these telescopes, you may wonder, like, what am I looking to get next telescope-wise? What, what do I want? What am I looking out for is something that's cool. I'm not really looking to buy any telescopes, to be honest. I, uh, I haven't purchased a new telescope in about a year. The last one I purchased was the, the FSQ 106, and I've been investing most of my time into using that telescope, but most of the holes in my focal length and resolution range needs are pretty much met for. What it's about now is having access to another part of the night sky with the Southern Hemisphere Observatory I'm working on and maybe doing a bit better for uh, solar and lunar photography, uh, dealing with, you know, the C11 or dealing with my C925, maybe switching it out for something else are really the only things I'm looking at. Um, as far as getting a big telescope to own myself, one day I would like to own a plane wave telescope of some kind, but financially it doesn't make any sense to do right now. Hopefully one day I'll have one of my own, but if I had a lofty goal for a telescope to own, I would probably want a 24 inch plane wave, but <laughs> I'm not going to be able to afford such things for probably, I don't know, a decade or more. So maybe that's on the horizon, maybe not, but one day I'd like to have a larger telescope. Of course, we all want a one meter telescope too. That's always a thing, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I hope you maybe learned a little bit about telescopes and I hope this answered some of your questions about what I'm using to shoot all my photos. If you have any questions about what telescopes you should be using or which ones you should get. Feel free to drop a question in the comments. I'm also working on another video right now just covering basically every type of telescope out there and I'll be dropping a lot of recommendations in that video as well. So I hope you found this helpful. Uh, I will catch you all in the next one.